Ready? Ritholtz Wealth Management is coming to Chicago. If you've ever want to learn more about what it's like to be a client of the firm, this is your chance. You're going to meet Michael Batnick, Ben Carlson, Bill Sweet, Tadis Visconti will be there. I will be there. Plus, four of our top financial planners, including the co-founder of the firm, Chris Venn, along with three Chicago-area financial planners who work with the firm. Um, also, if you're an advisor looking to join the firm, this is your chance. We'll be there March 6th, March 7th, March 8th. Email info at WitholtzWealth.com, and we will make time for you. This is going to fill up fast, so reach out as soon as you can. Thank you. We'll see you in Chicago. I think we got it. Today's show is brought to you by Crane Shares. I want to focus your attention on something that Brendan O'Hearn produces every day. ChinaLastNight.com. On today's show, we spoke with Jason Shu, and it came up that Jason did this thing where the headlines in the West do not exactly line up with the price action. And Jason was looking at it over a long ter- longer term period, over a 12-month period. Brendan O'Hearn has shown recently the dichotomy between the headlines, like that morning in a lot of these publications versus the actual, like forget about the narrative, like the actual price action and the discrepancies are pretty interesting. So if you want to learn more about what's going on and why, visit chinalastnight.com. And again, to learn more about the risks of investing in China, visit craneshares.com to learn more. Oh my God, 79. Very, very, very exciting. Very exciting. Chinese government is worrying all the capitalists in the world way more than it used to. And of course we don't like that. And we wish that China and the United States got along better. And if you stop to think about it, think of how massively stupid both China and the United States have been to allow the existing tensions to arise. What bad is ever going to happen to China or the United States if, if we two are close? If we make good friends out of the Chinese and vice versa, who in the hell is ever going to bother us? What do you I, think about that, Jason? That was Da Vinci. That's, Char- that's, Char- that's Charlie Munger talking about relations between the U.S. and China, and he's got investments that are Chinese equities, um, and he's been investing in China for a very long time, way before most U.S. you know retail investors were even able to. Um, what do you think of that concept? Is it like, is it naive or is it an ideal that we should maybe aspire to? What are your, what are your thoughts, Josh? Before I get started, Happy Chinese New Year! This is why the red scarf. Oh, uh, we were gonna get there. Ah, okay. I had questions. <laughs> before so, I even introduce you, I just want to hear your your take. No, Charlie is right. I mean, if you look at the world, right, the world's basically now driven by two growth engines, American and the Chinese. I think of the Americans as the scientists in this relationship and the Chinese as the engineer. And it's a really intertwined and symbiotic relationship, right? Like we invent the cutting edge business model, the technology and the Chinese with their engineering culture makes it cheaper, uh, better quality and in mass quantity, right? Like we can't collect the rent our IP without someone actually making the manufacturing goods. Right. So, I mean, I think it's wrong to see kind of the U.S. and China as U.S. and Soviet Union of the 80s, right? Because there was not a lot of trade going on. But that is the prevailing sentiment but at the moment. But people want to see it that way, right? But that's just not true because we trade so much. We Neither side can afford to royally piss each other off and actually go their separate ways, right? Our friend shoring, like, can you friend shore away from China to Mexico to Vietnam? Vietnam, by the way, is both smaller and also another communist country, right? It's not possible. Can China move away from this massive U.S. consumer market? Who are they going to replace that with? So there's going to be a lot of restraint shown. And I think ultimately that's good for everyone. China is not satisfied with the U.S. being the scientist. They want to be both. Yes. That's a source of a lot of the tension. And uh, I think that's the thing that has the potential to spill over away from business, but really into like a geopolitical situation. 
Yeah, you know, that's the thing with being number two, right? The number two is always looking, well, how can I get to be the number one? And of course, the number one is always thinking, well, I got to keep a distance. I don't want the number two to be number one. So there's always going to be that You just described mine tension. and Josh's relationship. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm not going to ask who's number one. <laughs> well, I'm not the scientist. That I could tell you. That I could tell you. All right, Jay, first of all, let's give you a proper introduction. We're so happy that you're here. Um, you were with us last June. We recently uncovered. <laughs> uh, Jason Shu is the founder and CIO of Raliant Global Advisors. Uh, it's an asset manager specializing in asset allocation and investment management across developed and emerging markets with $13 billion in AUM. Jason is also an adjunct professor of finance at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. Jason, welcome back to the show. Glad to be back. So happy to hear. It's the year of the rabbit. Yes. Okay. Uh, Chinese uh, New Year or Lunar New Year? Lunar New Year. Okay. Yeah. Was uh, when? Last week? Last week, last Sunday. Okay. What is the significance of the year of the rabbit okay, Cult so, culturally? Yeah. If you're born in the year of the rabbit, uh, this is your year. But little do you know, your year tends to be a bad year for you. So if you're a rabbit, so you're either 12 or 24, multiples of 12. Because there's, tw there's, 12, there's yeah. 12 different 12 years. 12 animals, right? Uh, you got to wear red. Okay. It'll keep... Keep the evil spirits away. Okay. Why? Are you the year of the rabbit? No, I'm rolling off. I'm the year of the you don't tiger. 12. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I just rolled off my year. So I still got some residual bad luck hanging around. So I got to wear my red scarf. What about okay. the pin? What, what does the pin represent? Oh, this came from my wife's museum. So mm. she works at the Boston Museum of oh, Fine Arts. beautiful. And this is off of one of their prize collection. So it's a, it's a famous is that uh, a dragon? painting of dragon. Yes. The head of the Very dragon. Nice. Very cool. All you right. Get it at the gift store. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Everybody visit the, is it the Boston Museum of Fine Arts? Yes. Okay. Everyone uh, go visit. Jason will be eating lunch there uh, when you come in. I want to talk about the new meme that's spreading uh, around uh, people that watch the economy and watch the market. And everyone now is tripping over themselves to um, explain the strength in the market that we've seen since the calendar year turned over. Um, probably started earlier than that. But uh, China's reopening is going to be the thing that gives the United States its soft landing. Um, demand coming back from Chinese consumers, demand for equipment and commodities and all of the things that we export, not just to China, but around the world. Like China deciding they're finished with lockdowns and zero COVID policy and just let's, let's get back to the way things were. Do you see it that way? Uh, definitely. I mean, it's contributed to the positive sentiment, right? I mean- First of all, um, you know, the China lockdown, we always thought, well, could that spill over to something worse, right? Because, you know, there's that, you know, closing the border, closing the country mentality to now. All of a sudden, Beijing says, we're going to shift. We're not going to double down on a non-functioning policy. So that kind of flexibility from Beijing signals that they could go 180 on other things, which we've seen, right? They've gone 180 in terms of their fight with the SEC, now letting the SEC to go out of Chinese companies. They're extending an olive branch to Europe, inviting, you know, Germany to come and talk and really saying we're going to be great trade partners, right? This is important. So I think that 180 ship, COVID policy and trade policy bodes really well, right? Is the message for uh, Americans seeing the COVID-related protests and seeing the regime basically, I don't, I don't want to say give in, but uh, have a change of heart. Is that like, should that be encouraging for everyone paying attention to this? That there, even though it's even though it's not a democracy, and even though it doesn't have a lot in common with the political system in, U in Europe or in the United States, there's still a mechanism by which popular opinion can sway the direction the government decides to go. And overall, that's probably be a better outcome than the government double, doubling down. Um, so, like, that's how we should think about this, right? Absolutely. I think when you look at COVID opening up, it's more than, hey, Chinese consumers are going to buy stuff and their factories are going to be humming. It's bigger. You say it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that, right? Okay. And it's exactly the point you made, which is you didn't know. It could go the other direction, right? People protesting, you know, the despot of old would go and crush the, the yeah, protest. Yeah. But Beijing didn't, right? Beijing said, look, you know, we're going to side with the people. They want opening up. We're going to open up. We're going to take our off-ramp, about face, and move forward. Uh, okay. It's a good sign, right? Because easily you could have the politicians, due to face issue, due to ego issue, doubling down on That's the policy. hardest part, right? Yeah. Nobody wants to look like they lost something. Yep. For okay. Beijing to, to do that 180 and shrug it off and move forward, 
I think that's big. I think the world's got to take notice. Like, you're dealing with someone who, you know, is rational, cares about the people, recognize the power still sits somehow, even if you're a one-party state, with the people, right? You got to keep the people happy. Some of the big, ma- some of the big, th- the big bad stories that the macro-focused bears um, were were harping on last year. I don't want to say they've completely gone away, but I would say we didn't get worst case scenarios out of them. We were worried about a very cold winter in Europe and what that would do to the supply of natural gas. Um, that didn't end up happening. Yep. We Europe got through this. We were worried about you know China's. Uh, COVID situation, that went the right way, or at least so far. Um, there, so, like, this is just, like, one more domino falling in the favor of the Bulls, which— It's a and, lot of dominoes. It's a lot of dominoes, yeah. but, like, so forget about, like, wind resorts and 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 uh, all of the, the Macau uh, casino stocks. Of course, those were going to double. Even Tesla, the reopening of the economy, obviously the Shanghai Gigafactory yeah. being extremely important to Tesla. Those were obvious— But we just got across the board rallies and things like Deer and Caterpillar and all of the gigantic cyclical industrial types of stocks. And it's, I mean, I don't want to speak, I don't want to get too excited. It seems somewhat sustainable because it is not just stock prices rallying, but it's being accompanied by these dominoes falling the right way. You know what hit all time high today? Illinois Tool Works. Right. Michael Antonelli was tweeting about this. Exactly the type of stock. Does this happen in a recession? This is one of the most economically sensitive companies in the in the country. Do you think this is su- sustainable? We will see because okay. today after the bill, we got yeah. Apple, we got Amazon, and uh, we'll see first of all what their numbers look like and, of course, uh, what their guidance look like. So I think we're probably— I don't think Amazon could take down Caterpillar. Like, I just think we're, pe- we're past that right now because Amazon has Amazon problems. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I don't like Amazon will cite the mac you know challenging macro environment, but everyone knows what the issue is there. They're lapping the 2000 uh the the uh the the pandemic levels of growth which are obviously not so repeatable. I yeah. I think this is the best description that I've seen of what happened yesterday during Powell's press conference which stocks initially sold off briefly but then they just ripped yeah. into the close. So Dalip Singh said Nick Timoreos tweeted him in an article from the journal. He said, quote, markets rallied fiercely despite the hawkish, me- hawkish message because investors know the Fed isn't omniscient, nor is it dogmatic. <laughs> Economic conditions are in charge when the Fed is in data-dependent mode. I thought that was a really, really good way to put it. Yeah, the, da- the data just keeps getting better. What do you yeah. think about that? Well, so, I mean, you know, the Fed's got two things it's got to watch for, right? It's got to watch for inflation, and that's been the primary focus. Uh, and at some point, right, once inflation is not an issue, it's got to look at GDP growth and, and job growth. Uh, I think we're gradually exiting the mode where the Fed is going to be hiking rates, right? Because inflation will naturally ease. You know, the more time we give it, the more you know, prices stabilize. Well, base effects, it's guaranteed to ease. Exactly. The yes, question is effect. at what rate? The Fed was a 2022 story. It dominated the market alongside inflation, and that's in the rearview mirror. And so is inflation for the most part. Um, we got jobless claims this morning, lowest since April 2022. And on top of that, on top of that, you have labor costs rising at 1.1% quarter over quarter, which is below the 1.5% estimate. So you have still an extremely tight labor market with wage pressure coming down, coming down. And you have mortgage rates back below 6%. So the housing market might not crash. And earnings are okay. Getting so, a lot of good news. Here. So what's the, the what's the bare case? And you have people that are so p- positioned so offsides that are not positioned for this rally. So you could say that valuations are stretched or don't, don't make sense with a five-year risk rate or four, four wherever we're at, fine. But that doesn't matter for, for the short term because for the short term, people are offsides and they have to chase. If Apple, Amazon, and Google don't shit the bed, it's game on. Yeah, and I think that's the big one, right? Because right now, what we have is not sort of fundamental driven rally, right? It's sentiment, you know, forecasting the fundamental. And it's going to be tricky, right? It's, it's sort of knife edge, right? You get a really bad uh, number coming out of Amazon or uh, Apple, could be both. It could shift the other way really quickly. Absolutely, but you don't get you don't get uh, Facebook rise gaining twenty three percent in a day without people being massively offsides. No, but the sen- the sentiment part is important because the leaders in January of this year were the biggest laggards last year. Yeah, and I actually I want to quote uh, Savita Subramani and put this out today. She's calling it a sentiment driven rally. First of I all, agree. January was a historic month for a 60-40 portfolio, 96th percentile month in history mm-hmm. back to 1921. 
So in a century, what went on in January for a 60-40 portfolio was better than any other uh, month other than like 4% of all. I mean, that's – all right. Um but what else to just, say? just also getting back to sentiment, we Josh and I did a did a live event with with uh, Dan Nathan and those guys, and we asked people a show of hands who thinks the October low holds. Nobody, nobody, myself included. No, by the m- way. Uh, me too. By the way, me too. By the way, um, Savita notes the S and P gained back all of the losses of December, six point three percent total return for the month of January. Um, bonds also rallied. Long term Treasuries plus six point two percent. That was a 95th percentile total return. Uh, investment grade corporate bonds up 3.9, gold up 6.2. You couldn't lose money in That's January right. if you tried. But Josh, the only thing about I, and I I agree with with Savita, but it's it's a sentiment driven rally. Um, sort of takes away from the fact that it's also fundamentally driven as well. No, correct. But think about it. Facebook reported a five percent slowdown. Mm-hmm. The, so it, the fundamentals still aren't good. The sentiment was way worse correct. than the fundamentals. Correct. Correct. So she's saying the worst performing sectors in 2022 led last month. Consumer discretionary up 15%. Communication services up 14 Meanwhile, defensive utilities and staples both down 1%, 2%. The only sectors in the red. So it's a complete reverse. And look at, yeah. like, we you spoke about, how, we speak about housing stocks all the time. Like, if, if, unless the market is so wrong about where the economy is headed, housing stocks wouldn't be doing what they are. You look at, like, Home Depot. Not just the builders, but Home Depot, like the the ones that are really impacted by the consumer and their spending. And these stocks are on fire. But we're going to see what the underlying numbers are, right? Because unless earnings improve and, you know, grow at historical trend rate, a lot of what we're seeing is, you know, price multiple sort of fluctuating. And uh, and I think that's much more sentiment. Well, you're right. You could say that as much as stocks priced in a slowdown— in Q2, 3, 4 of last year, maybe they're pricing in too much improvement right now. We'll say uh, it could be, tr- it could be true. Let's do Absolutely. this. Let's do this chart. Escape velocity. Uh, so this is from this is from uh, uh, Renaissance Macro. We had uh, Jeff DeGraff on um, a couple of months ago. He was great. All right. So what they're looking at, what we're looking at is here. We're looking at a chart of twenty uh, day highs in the S and P five hundred. So the commentary that they give Russell is three thousand. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Got it, got it, got it. Uh, what they say is the market characteristics, which are beta, high cyclicals, et cetera, have been stronger than internal price data until yesterday. 20-day highs hit our bullish threshold level. Bears take note. It doesn't happen in the midst of bear markets. Narrative will fry you. What are the green arrows? These so are- the green arrows are where, where 20-day highs are close to 50%. So basically half of the market is at a 20-day high. Just definition of twenty day high is that's a calendar month. Yeah, oh. just by definition, that is not character characteristic of a bear market. What do you think about that? God, I'm probably still in the camp of this being a bit of a sentiment driven suckers rally. I'm worrying that we're gonna see some bad numbers with some negative guidance that'll still, I think, uh, scare people. So I, what would you need to see to come off that view? You know, I, I actually think we 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 need to see kind of the the pendulum swing fully the other way, right? getting valuation really cheap across the board and uh, seeing capitulation selling. Uh, and I think we haven't seen that in this cycle. So I'll push back a little bit. I think that one of the things that we saw is a lot of the bubbles popped, right? Like all the crypto shit, all of the SPACs, all of the Zilla, uh, Zooms of the world, Teladoc, whatever. Like they, a lot of these companies went down 90%. That's you true. saw Amazon go down 60. You saw Netflix go down 75, Facebook too. So what more do we need to see? Like to, to in, talk, in terms of like capitulation, what would you, what else are you waiting for? Yeah, I'm probably waiting to see kind of uh, 4P to go closer to about 16, which is kind of the historical low. If you look at kind of the band. How close did we get? We were at 17 or 18? No, we, we barely touched 20. Really? Yeah. On, on what? On S&P? On the S&P, yeah. I feel like small caps were 10. Uh, well, but the, the June mar- lows, small caps are probably ten times uh, forward. Yeah, but I guess the small caps are too small to move the the kind right. of broader S and P weighted average. Right. Yeah. Okay. So does that require a flush, or does it require maybe we don't get the flush, but we get four quarters worth of earnings starting to recover? Yeah, I think for I would say big institutions to kind of rebalance back and go into risk on uh, the the kind of big steady money, uh, it's probably going to take a few quarters of you know, earning surprising people to the upside. Okay. Um, we, 
let's do hard versus soft data. I think just before we move on to that, if I could paint the perfect scenario, just in terms of what I would like to see the market to do for the next, whatever, six to nine months, is a little bit of digestion. Like, I don't think I don't think I would be too, too excited if the S&P runs another 10% for no reason right now. Yeah. Well, Powell will not enjoy <laughs> watching that process But actually, so Lisa Bramos tweeted about this because I wasn't watching the press yesterday. I was doing something else. She said that... Chair Powell had an opportunity to aggressively push back against the stock market's rally year to date. He did not. The Nasdaq pops in the response. So I think there was a question about, do you think the stock market is getting ahead of itself? And he basically was like, eh. Yeah. That's smart that he's not overly talk, focused or talk, at least not talking about being focused on the stock market. I don't, I don't think that that's yeah, uh, not part of anyway. his mandate. So <laughs> no, let, let, let's, not. let's get into, I forget who did this. Um, this is from Haver Analytics. Oh, this is from Goldman. So talking about, yeah, that's from Goldman, talking about hard data versus soft data, how people feel versus what is actually happening. So they say since last June, GDP and other hard indicators of economic activity have consistently outperformed business surveys. Let's look at a few charts. So we're looking at hard versus soft data, and there is a pretty big divergence that really showed itself in the fourth quarter. So- the soft data is like somebody business calls service. you on the phone and says, has do you business. plan on hiring yeah. people yeah, next has year? Yeah, business. Right. Okay. So people that answer those calls probably tend to be older um, <laughs> and maybe a little bit more curmudgeonly. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, well, cert yeah, certainly. Okay. Um, Here's another quote. Surveys do not – survey data does not provide a perfect read on growth, and they are particularly error-prone when business sentiment is euphoric or depressed – Fears of imminent recession have been top of mind since the middle of last year, and as is visible in the gap between the blue and the red lines in the previous exhibit, the economy outperformed the business surveys throughout the last two quarters. Next chart, please. So this is a really, really good one. The red line, we're looking at subjective business trends. I guess this is year over year. Um, and the blue line is objective measures, like just straight data. And they track each other really closely. Look at, the the, only, look at that breakdown. The though. only time there's a divergence is 2009, yeah. when we're rebounding. Which makes sense. But look at the divergence that we've seen recently. It's staggering. This goes back to just how people feel versus what's actually happening. So what is the missing ingredient that's led to that much of a it's, disconnect? It's, it's a stimulus. It's inflation? It's a stimulus. People oh, having see. excess savings. So we keep thinking that the recession is coming. The recession is so coming. So Mike, I was going to say this only goes back to 05. So for me, the missing ingredient is inflation. It makes everyone feel way worse. Um, knowing that their costs are up for everything. So 100%, that's why people feel so shitty. But the reason why the data has not broken down, I think, is because in 2021, we're, when we were saying, if we get a recession, will this be the most obvious recession call ever? But what happened was, and we also said, corporations were flush with cash. There was a ton of bond issuance in 2020, 2021. And the consumer, I don't think we realized how well positioned they were. But I think there is another data that that you might want to pay attention to, which is uh -oh. they've, been, they've been checking. <laughs> Credit card spend, right? Like people are running out of, you know, available balances on their credit card, and we've seen the fastest decumulation in savings. And both I was of those telling Michael about that be, on Tuesday night. Yeah. He was very upset with no, me. No, I wasn't. No, Josh was citing Matt Klein's piece, which is excellent. I did get to read that. But if you listen to the earnings calls from Visa and American Express and Discover and Capital One, they're all saying the same thing. Things look pretty good. People are spending. But but you're right. Like, they're absolutely no, but your point about boundaries. Your point about you're right. savings declining. So normally the savings rate, like pre-pandemic, was 8%, 8 and it was 30 at the onset of the pandemic, and now it's 3%. Yeah. Could that go negative? Uh, sure, it could. Yeah. Yeah. When was the last time it went? Was probably a great financial crisis or – yeah, I mean, around every crisis time, right? You see people start to draw down because uh, obviously they're they're spending more than they can replace their income. Right. Part of the job loss, part of just sort of lower bonuses. But we're not in crisis now. So what do you, like where where do you think that's the trajectory of that is? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we aren't in crisis uh, because labor market is strong, but we're starting to see a slowdown there, or seeing layoffs in the highest pay sectors, mm. right? and that's obviously going to have an impact. Yeah, I did see data yesterday. I can't remember who was from if it was JP Morgan. Oh, a city. City credit card data and debit card spending was down big time in January. Like I know it's seasonal, but down a lot more than it normally is. So maybe um, I don't want to like completely dismiss the fact that consumers might run out of excess savings and the picture might look very different six months from now. Absolutely possible. Um, uh, Torsten Slack said it continues to look like a soft landing. 
ECI, which is Employment Cost Index, wage inflation is coming down, and the consensus is expecting non-farm payrolls on Friday to come in at 190K. And none of the indicators the NBER recession committee normally looks at suggest that we are in a recession. So what do you look? So what? So what do you focus on? So what I focus on, you know, valuation is still kind of the primary focus, right? Because uh, you know we came off of crazy valuation, mm-hmm. right? And so it's easy to go, ah, oh, you know, the market's fallen, you know, thirty percent. You know, some of the crazy stocks fallen 70 percent. And if you're like, oh, it's fallen a lot, how much more can it fall? But if you kind of put in the background uh, what is sort of normal valuation multiple given the kind of interest rate we have. Uh, it's you know, it's got to be a lot lower, yeah. right? Un, un, unless even the Fed says we're going to go back even to- Even though rates are coming down, at least at the intermediate term well, look uh, at the, rate. Where's the two-year? The two-year is down a lot. The two-year is down a lot, yes. So don't you get valuation support from the two, the 10, like, you know, pulling- I think For the 10-year sure. is down 80-something wow, basis points already the from year, the high. Year, the two-year is at 4.1. Yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, the lower the, the interest rate, the higher the valuation multiple we can support. But we're- ways away from the kind of valuation multiple and the kind of rate that we've seen, I'd say, you know, the last five years, right? So uh, what is the right valuation multiple for, say, a 4%, 4.5% on the short end? Uh, I don't think it's the kind of valuation multiple we're seeing right now. We, Especially not in NASDAQ. <laughs> well, we right. spoke about this a million times. What is the right multiple and do historic multiples, are they fair comparisons given how productive and efficient these gigantic companies are? And it is a debate that we will yeah, forever it's a have. Hard, hard on. Yeah. So I, I totally see both well, sides. Well, you don't know where they belong, but even if you did, you don't know where they're going to stop yeah. when they start going up or down. They always overshoot, right? Of course and, they're going to overshoot. Yeah, and the overshoot part is irrational, so you can't place a rational model to try to figure it out. Okay. I want to talk before we get to housing, let's just look at earnings estimates, which just continue to come down. Maybe this set up a lot of the rally. So we're looking at a tweet from Julian. I won't, I, sorry, I don't know his last name. Um, Josh, I believe that's uh, pronounced um, uh, Schwartzfeld. <laughs> no, Klimochiko? I don't know. Um, anyways, good follow on Twitter. This will be in the show notes on the video, et cetera. So he has a chart showing S&P 500 earnings estimates dropping like a rock, pricing an earnings growth of just 4% and at risk of a year-over-year year over year decline. The S&P 500 is trading at an above average 18 times earnings, makes it tough to support the bull case. Well, you could support the bull case so long as valuation isn't a part of what you do. <laughs> Right. Like if you want to, if you could leave that out. Well, also, time frame, right? Like today, tomorrow, next week, nobody cares about valuation. Right. But if you if you have a longer term investment horizon, absolutely it matters. Yeah, and, and again, you know, it gets hard when you're looking at longer horizon because over longer horizon, you got to say, well, what might be the rate you know, over the next ten years? Could be a lot lower, so it could support a higher valuation. It could be higher. Uh, we don't know. And of course, earnings is clearly going to recover and continue to grow. And so, you know, what kind of earnings should we sort of base off of the valuation multiple? So you got too many changing and moving parts uh, once you extend your horizon now the next five. So for me, the number one determinant of whether or not we're going to have a recession this year is is housing. Like, does it get significantly worse? And I don't- I don't see it. You don't see it either, right? Yeah. And then part of this, this is not 2007, right? Most people don't have a floating rate arm that's going right. to adjust. Most people have a normal 30-year mortgage. They locked in at three and a half, three and three quarters. There's no pressure to sell. And the quality of the borrowers is better. Absolutely. And the banks are not risking their balance sheet. with Banks with, been way more cautious. And there's five buyers for every seller. <laughs> and interest the 30-year just take below 6%. And so you saw inventory build as the housing market. The housing market was frozen in the fourth quarter, right? Yeah. There was there was no activity. Yeah. Can we put this— uh, But that's we, about as bad as it's going to get, right? right? The fact that it's illiquid. If you are a desperate seller, sure, you're going to take right. a hit. Right. But there's no one who's forced into liquidation. Very few. So inventory— This is, this a, great, is, this is a great choice. This is from Mike Altos. Uh, I'm sorry, Mike Simonson and Altos Research. They do great work. Um, so inventory built throughout the third and fourth quarter, like dramatically, off of historically low levels. And you were seeing price cuts all over the place. I saw this in my town. I'm on Zillow all the time. Price cuts left and right. And uh, you see that house on shore that's now 1.5 down from 1.9. Which one? Uh, swimming pool. Uh, big big house, like 7,200 square feet. Whoa. Oh, that one I'm at the I, end. No. I really like that house. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. You know which one I'm talking yes. about? So Mike's, I'm going to buy it for you as a present. Oh, uh, so sweet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Mike Simonson said price cuts are evaporating. Down to 33.9% of the market with a recent price reduction. This bodes well for transportation. Okay, whatever. So next chart, please. So this is a chart showing the percent of properties with recent price reductions. And this is seasonal, of course, but 
they're coming down a lot. Wait, this is percent of properties with recent price reductions, U.S. Yeah, single so down family is homes. Good. Yeah, down is good. Down is good. Down is good. I mean, that means that there's less price cuts. Okay. So, I, so activity already springboarded, like housing activity, mortgage applications rocketed. I think prices will not necessarily go back to the autumn highs, but activity is picking up dramatically. So to Josh's point, this is like one more massive, massive potential roadblock for a soft landing. And it seems that we might just do it. Yeah. I think the risk was never about a housing market driven recession or a a lot housing, of people are saying that. Yeah, a housing crash that caused a debilitating balance sheet value decline. You know, people point to that just because that's the, the last, last big one. That's right? the last yeah, war. Yeah, the last war, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this one, it's all going to be how strong are the consumers going to stay in their spending mode and corporate spending. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of what's taking away from corporate spending, and that's something we don't talk enough about. It's like, yeah, the Fed's been printing money and sending that to the consumers. Similarly, American companies have been printing money, right? They print a lot of stock options yeah. at record high valuation, and those stock options now become worthless. Probably fewer employees are willing to take those. So I think their spending power has been sort of, you know, cut down to size because their inability to, to sort of issue cheap currency. So I think that should be taken into consideration. So I wanted, I wanted, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, Can I just say one last thing about the housing yeah, crash and then we'll move on? Please. Um, speaking of housing crashes, uh, a day before the Fed, so that was— what was the Fed today? That was Monday. Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday. So Michael Barry tweeted sell. That's all he tweeted, just sell. Um, sell puts, though. Exactly. So you don't understand exactly. what he meant. Exactly. Um, Jim Cramer said buy the dip. And uh, you can imagine the response on Twitter. A lot of donking on one person and supporting the other. Michael Barry has since deleted his, his account. He'll be back. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about corporate spending. Um, buybacks, but also like very ambitious kind of empire building were part of the story of the recovery from COVID in 2020, 2021. Amazon, Apple, these companies just hiring with abandon. Now, but there are certain market environments where Wall Street loves it when companies do aggressive shit like that and their multiples expand and they get more buy recommendations. But then like the mood changes. And right now companies are being incredibly well rewarded for saying things like efficiency, discipline. Facebook, that's the entire call yesterday. The whole thing. It's a whole call. Right. So Facebook doesn't have growth. What they have now is a newfound respect for their investors. And so if we're in that, if we're in that environment now where companies are being cheered on for firing people and for dropping CapEx and for like calming down. It's a lot of runway. Yeah, but that's like real world spending decisions also. Yeah. So from my perspective, that's not great for like enterprise tech, like software, uh, or but maybe I have that wrong. How do you or look cloud, at that? Cloud, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely, right? Like, there was a time, like you say, um, when Wall Street wanted to interpret everything as positive, right? So yeah. you hired an employee, they just said, "Oh, you hired an employee for half a million dollars. Yeah, beast he's mode. gonna he's yeah. gonna produce twenty x, right?" Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now they realize, no, if you just randomly hire people and pay them lots of money, and they don't produce, you're just burning money, right? And of course, back then you had cheap money, you had cheap stock options that you could burn. The good uh, old days. Yeah, the did good you old watch, days. Did you watch any of these TikToks where, like, there's like a 23 year old girl who's like in her first job out of college, <laughs> and her job it looks like she's a coffee sommelier. <laughs> she's like going from floor to floor and like making snacks, and she's narrating it like this is my job at Google or whatever, or I think she was actually at Meta. But there's like multiple versions of that. Uh, like I love my job so much and they're like in a hammock with a laptop. <laughs> that was like the pinnacle of that idea that you would go to work at Alphabet you know, that lasted and there years. would be somebody come behind uh, you and give you a massage. That was the whole last decade. It's yeah. crazy. Remember we went to Google and we saw that? No, but I th – yes. But I think it like really hit its apex with like um, the TikTok videos going yeah. viral because so many people were like – my job's not like that. <laughs> like, like I don't get five snacks a day and there's no cheese tasting and there's no uh, massage massage therapist on staff. So you know, it's what happens. It's when a mood, you have, but it's a mood shift yeah. now. And it's what happens when you have cheap money and you have no accountability, right? People are just throwing money at you. Uh, I think, you know, we're back to fundamentals. We're back to sort of rational business decision making, which is good, right? Because for mm -hmm. long-term health and economy, you can't have cheap capital leading you to sort of wasteful, unproductive, Un unproductive pursuit, right? You're hiring top graduate students from the top universities and tell them to work on pet projects that if they fail, it doesn't really matter, right? Yeah, that, that was they, that was what yeah. they were saying. Yeah, and so you, you you got to sort of, you know, 
instill discipline. And I think this is good, right? This is this is why bear markets and recessions or or you know They're negative healthy. growth is healthy because it take the excess and 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 some of the bad. Zuckerberg said stuff. working at Meta is fun again because the people that are still there are the people that actually want to do work and ship product yeah. and feel good about what they're doing and the party is over. And there were a lot of people who didn't say anything while they were there. I'm just, now I'm just, I'm, I'm like adding on to what he was saying. I think there were a lot of people who were sitting in Menlo Park, just like, what the hell is going on yeah. here? Why, why is this a circus and our software sucks? <laughs> so I, I think that's another reason why these periods are healthy. So, so, Absolutely. so yeah. this, this was all driven by inflation and interest rates rising and needing to get serious because Wall Street was killing their stocks. And think about the vitriol with which we were speaking about Powell a year ago. Yeah. He doesn't oh, know what he's not, doing. Not he's, you and I, though. Like yeah, okay. Why? Are I'm you f- serious? <laughs> you killed him. No, I just thought- You killed I thought him. he started late. I thought dude, he started late. Dude, you And kill- I think that's still- I'm not pointing fingers. I, I, everyone, I wasn't did thrilled he, did with he him. Did he start on time? My point is this. The No. Okay, I'm not saying so you're the, wrong. Here's my point. My point is this, the, the idea that we are even talking about a potential soft landing seriously and not pie in the sky shit, like data supporting that is kind of crazy considering where we were not that long ago. Yeah. I thought we would be have a recession in Europe. Europe had faster GDP growth than China last year. What is he doing? He's breaking the housing market. He's breaking this. No, no, no. But like just like everyone's economic assumptions, there's there were too many weird things going on. Were you surprised though by by uh, by how well Europe hung in there, how well the United States has hung has hung in there so far? I'm absolutely surprised by how many things went our way, right? Like statistically speaking, we're not supposed to get that lucky, right? Like we pulled the rabbit out of the hat. Yeah, there's no guarantee that the winter was warm, right. not bitter right. cold, right? Like we outperform, and that's not due to us, right? That's really God's work, right? <laughs> um, it could have gone worse. Absolutely. Okay, uh, let's do some China stuff. I want you to teach us something. Um, cause we read all your stuff and you included a lot of things here in the doc. And I don't know if we want to go through these. No, don't go through all that. We're not going to go through all of them, but give us like, give us the story from the perspective of someone who's a global investor, which you are, and someone who really understands these g- different geographies because last year international stocks outperformed the U S and there was a huge bottoming process in Chinese equities, which I think when did, when was, when did that really take place, would you say October, November timeframe? Probably November. Yeah. Okay. And the rally has just been inc- incredible. Yeah. Okay. How should we think about 2023 from the perspective of somebody who's allocating all over the world? I would say, look, you got to have a balanced focus on kind of the fundamental growth. And there's not going to be a lot of really strong growth for China or for the world, right? Because the world's sort of recovering and some data are bad and expectation may be, you know, uh, outperformed by reality, but it's still not, the reality is still not strong growth, right? So there's there's a place for that, but there's a sort of balanced consideration you got to give to what does the price tell you? What has been priced into share prices? And I would say, look, right. you look at Europe, you look at China, the expectation, right, the sentiment that was priced in was Europe was going to freeze over and succumb yeah. to Putin, right? That was yeah. the expectation. Or not and, have food supplies. Yeah, people are going to die because... They can't afford food, they can't afford energy, but all they have to do is outperform that, right? Yeah. The expectation for China, and we talked about that already, right, was, you know, for China to, you know, invade Taiwan, start a war with the U.S., right, to embrace Putin in the unlimited friendship, and cra- even crazier COVID policy. All China has to do is really not do that, right? <laughs> don't, do that. Don't, <laughs> don't run over protesters with the tank, and that's... Like good news. Lots of low bars. You, yeah. you did this really great thing on your LinkedIn, which everyone should be following, Jason Shu on LinkedIn. You did this thing, China Asia's reaction to negative Western headlines might surprise you. Yeah. So you made the point that every time the negative headlines start to get ratcheted up about what's going on in China, um, the assumption is I should get out of Chinese stocks. And I just want to give people a sampling of this because it's awesome. January 2020. China faces outbreak of COVID-19. Over the next 12 months, uh, Chinese stocks went up 36%. Um, March 2018, U.S. slaps tariffs on Chinese imports. Next 12 months, plus 2%. Uh, May 2019, Trump increases tariffs on Chinese goods, up 9%. Two, this is my favorite. October 2006, Ally North Korea conducts first wow. nuclear tests. 
China went up 287% in the next 12 months. So um, we have a habit as human beings of assuming cause and effect or thinking that we heard a piece of news, therefore we're the only people that have heard it <laughs> or it just happened or it's just now going to be reacted to when in truth – uh, things are priced in way ahead of when anyone in America actually is aware of them. And there's something else people don't realize that we think of um, news reporters as someone who's out there discovering the unknown story and then reporting it to you, right? That may be true maybe two decades ago, right? Today, something happens, something good happens, and the newspaper reporter is scrambling to ask someone, why did that happen? So they're generally providing a somewhat superficial sort of color commentating of the good news that just happened, right? Yeah. So if the stock market's fallen, they'll go find some bad news. And I think readers are confused. I think this is some, you know, investigative forecast about the future when in fact um, they're just sort of doubling down on the the, the bad event that has just happened and uh, and sort of bringing that to the attention. The editors-in-chief of, um, of all the publications that cover the markets or the economy, they have their own like in-joke about – how they'll like the stock market opens, the Dow opens down 200 points. They'll put up a headline, uh, Dow falls on latest Trump investigation. And then the market reverses itself. And Amazon. all they do is, is change falls into rises. <laughs> they say Dow rises on latest Trump investigation. They don't even need to change the reason. They just have to change the, the information. So we just got earnings releases. Before I look at the earnings uh -huh. and the stock reaction, Google was up 7%. Dude, I don't want a muted reaction from you today. Stop. I want the I'm full bringing it. I'm bringing it. All right. Google was up 7% today going into earnings. Uh -huh. Like it closed out the highs. Apple closed out the highs. Amazon almost at the highs. All right. All right so what do we got? What do we got? Okay. So Amazon okay. See it. is up 1.7% after the close. All right. So, well, I got so, a minute to put a minute in while he while Amazon he net sales, $149 billion, estimated 145.8. So it beat on sales. AWS, 21.4, estimated 21.7. All right, we'll see. Not so great there. I think Qualcomm is out. What a, what, what a, what a, after Don't worry close. about Qualcomm. Um, Amazon, all right, guidance. Amazon guidance, sees yeah. Q1 sales, 121 to 126, estimated 125.5. Not great there, but not terrible either. The stock is up 3.3%. Apple's ripping $3 post close. Yeah, but Apple doesn't report to 430. Excuse me, Alphabet. Sorry. Oh. Uh, Alphabet? Al Alphabet's, uh, Alphabet you, you want it in dollars or percentage? Dollars. What are you talking Alphabet about? Alphabet is what up $4 dollars and nine cents per share. What are we doing here? <laughs> um, Post close. All right. So there you have it. We'll like get that more. Number. But uh, Amazon, the knee jerk is up. So that's good. That's good. I know. These days, if you're in line with expectation, it's good all right, news. Jason, do you want us to erase all the shit you said before this? <laughs> or <are> you, you, <laughs> Duncan, you, you have time, right? Jason, listen. No, but so- so this is just, I guess it's just going to, it's going to build on what we got already this week. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay. But so and this is just, None of the numbers yeah. are surprisingly good, but I guess people are expecting worse, right? So if you're in line, it's pretty good. It's just positioning right now. That's all. Um, you included this link and talked about uh, Bill Gates and his view on China and how Bill Gates opposes the hawkishness in the United States and uh, calls it a lose-lose mentality. You, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what you see happening there? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is very similar to what we opened the show with, right? Munger's sort of sentiment about, like, if the U.S. and China, leadership from both sides, find a way to, you know, be Co good friends. Cooperate. Cooperate, right? Yeah. There are going to be disagreements, absolutely, uh, but it's probably easier to work out those disagreements as collaborative trading partners and then put pressure on each other uh, than trying to, you know, friends shoring away from each other, right? Because then you lose leverage. Like, U.S. has great leverage on China because it buys so much from China. Right. The minute you stop buying, well, what leverage do you got? Right. Uh, I'm just looking at, sorry, I'm cutting, I'm cutting in. Amazon, um, North American segments, North American sales increased 13% year over year. That's kind of, that's a lot. International, we know there's going to be a drag there, down 8%. AWS, 20%. That's the only number that matters. AW, that 20% yeah. is probably the lowest it's been. It's the lowest it's been, yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 And, uh, and it's, just, it's in line with what Microsoft the stock, reported. The stock's not going to be up. Th uh, let's see what the stock's doing. Oh, stock's down now. But probably not by a lot. Yeah. No, not a lot. 60 base points. All right. Not bad. Not bad. All right. Let's do this chart. Uh, oh, here's another thing, right? Here's another thing talking about positioning. The stock. This chart. Yeah, let's, let's do – let's – so this is hedge funds have moved swiftly to rebuild China exposure. 
there were a variety of reasons for people to want to take down international exposure in general, like over the last oh, yeah. 10 years, starting with massive underperformance um, and China exposure in particular. And then there were threats that these stocks would all be delisted and you don't want to get caught in a de delisted yep. stock or have to switch share classes or buy something in Hong Kong. Um, so whatever, people just threw in the towel and that leads to the rally that we got. And this is basically showing Chinese equities as a percentage of Goldman Sachs prime book based on net market value. This is, uh, am I reading it right to say this is a doubling? Yeah. yeah, Jason, I want your opinion on this. So we're looking at Chinese equities as a percent of Goldman Sachs prime book, and it crashed from a high of 15% in July 2020 yeah. to 7% in the fall of 2022. I know this is chicken and egg. Are Chinese stocks falling because people are dumping them or are people dumping them because they're falling? You know, oftentimes it's people dumping them because they're falling. Right, that's what I'm, that's what yeah. I, I'm inclined to say. You know, like international investors, their influence on the market at least on the Chinese stock market, is far smaller, right? Because this is not the case where you got a tiny market and a lot of international hot money can prop it up or crash it. Like the Chinese equity market, right? The onshore A shares, it's about $15 trillion in size, the world's second Holy largest smokes. equity market. And it's- Is that, is that right? Yeah. It's yeah. 15? So 15 a couple trillion. of hedge funds in New York are not going to- Not going to move anything. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. And so oftentimes, like, you know, that market will move given its own local dynamics. And uh, the international investors simply say, hey, look, if it's falling a lot, it's a bit of an optics risk. It's a bit of a career risk, you know, window dressing, get rid of it. I think that um, your investor, if you're in the United States, your investors probably get more mad if you lose their money in Chinese stocks. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's very asymmetric, right? Like, they'll be like, what the hell are you doing? Like, why do you, why do we own Baba and Tencent? Right. What are you What are you thinking? Yeah, have you heard of Apple? <laughs> right. Oh, this is this is interesting. Have you heard of Google? Speaking of YouTube ad revenue, fell Ooh. year over year. Yeah, that's right. Our, there's a quote from Google: "Our long term investments in deep computer science make us extremely well positioned as AI reaches an inflection point, and I'm excited." Uh, but whatever. Uh, Google's down a little bit. Google's down two point four percent. 1.8. All right, so fairly muted reactions from Amazon and Google. I mean, we had monster moves in the stock today, so monster moves. All right. Monster moves. Uh, IMF GDP growth forecast for 2023 recent re released. John, you have this chart? Mm -hmm. So they have the United States growing at 1.4%, um, global growth at 2.9%, emerging markets 4%, China 5.2%, um, India 6.1%. And we're going to talk about India in a second, uh, about a very specific story. But what's your take on whether or not we need to pay attention to these growth forecasts uh, or how far away they are from what expectations already were? I think that the growth forecast is largely priced in. And, you know, there's that famous study, right? Even if I tell you, not just the forecast, I tell you the actual GDP numbers ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, you would not have made money knowing that future information. And that's just how uncorrelated the stock market is to the actual GDP. So like the emphasis on GDP is really misplaced because GDP growth don't always translate into corporate earnings growth. Right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. corporations are cutting jobs, right? And that's going to hurt GDP. But they're actually improving margin, improving profitability, getting more discipline. So I think it's just important There's to realize. There's a zillion examples of this. Yeah. Where the fastest growing country had the worst performing stock market yep. uh, and vice versa. Was China one of them? Uh, no, China and U.S. are actually the two outliers where the GDP growth and the corporate earnings growth uh, are kind of in the same direction. And the stock market results over time are decent. Um, you know, like the rest of the emerging market, and I have the paper uh, that came out last year um, that document this, and the rest of EM actually had the opposite, right? Where strong GDP growth actually resulted in uh, oftentimes below GDP growth, corporate earnings, and even negative corporate earnings. So when you're choosing exposures, what, what framework are you using if not uh, economic growth? Corporate earnings growth, right? Okay. You really, because that's what you're buying, right? You're buying companies and their ability to grow earnings. Yeah, you're buying a share of companies. Yeah. You're not buying oh, a share of GDP. Jason, can you talk about how long, how how correlated are corporate earnings to GDP? Very low. And the reason for that, like US, we think of them being correlated because we look at the US example, right? US is unique. And in fact, China and US are the two where a lot of the economy is actually listed, right? To have your economy listed, you need two things. You need to have a vibrant venture capital market, right? So you can incubate your entrepreneurs, right? Without capital, you know, 
a Panda Express would still be a little Chinese restaurant in New York. Right? Right. So you need a vibrant venture capital market. That exists in the U.S. We invented that. We export that to China. It's vibrant and strong. And then the next thing is, then you've got to have a liquid enough stock market with good valuation multiple. Then you could you know, list your company and get liquidity for the owners. Again, most countries don't have a liquid enough stock market, and it's or they're insignificant as part of the, the global index. So they all often just get you know uh, uh, eliminated because they're too small to matter. And so you know, China and U.S. are kind of lucky in that the underlying real economy tends over time become listed, so you can participate, and they're almost you know two sides of the same coin. Right. Many other economies, like in, in emerging markets. I was right? going to ask you, are there other list. emerging market economies where they're on the right path toward that? You know, the Asian countries tend to be. Okay. Uh, and that's because, you know, they they always, they have a template. Right? The Asian economy, go, oh, let's look at Japan. Right? And Japan, of course, imitated the U.S. And then, you know, South Korea, there's Taiwan. So there's that path where they're imitating. Uh, but that is the minority when you look at the EM basket. A lot of EM countries, um, you know, it's just the big state-owned enterprises that list. Yeah. No one else gets to list. Yeah, and they're missing such a huge opportunity to lift people into the, the middle class and then into the upper class. The lack of capital is yeah. a problem. I'm kind of surprised. So Google was up 7% today. Oh, it's falling a little bit more now. It's down, I'd say I'm surprised it's not that more. It's down 5%, so it's still oh. up on the day. But advertising revenue was 59 versus 60 estimated, and YouTube ads, as I mentioned, was weak, was 7.96 versus 8.27 estimate. And the stock's down 5%. I mean, it sounds kind of, it still seems- What did they do over the last month is the point. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Right? Yeah. Can I ask you about, uh, do you have an, you don't have to have an opinion on buy or sell the stock, but this story about Adani Enterprises hmm. seems like it's one of the biggest stories of all time. This will 100% be a Netflix uh, movie or TV show. Um, it might be based in India and we'll see how this thing resolves. But basically, this is a company that has now lost over $100 billion in market cap in two weeks since a U.S.-based short seller has criticized it, and not just randomly with a tweet, but like they did two years. It's a full-blown investigation. So Hindenburg did eight. Hindenburg is the company for our listeners who aren't familiar. Hindenburg is the short-selling research firm that exposed the scam artist who was running Nikola where he was pushing yep. an electric truck down a hill and letting it roll and pretending there was an engine in there or pretending there was a, a battery in there. Um, and of course, that probably saved investors a lot of aggravation because that stock was on its way up uh, when he exposed that. Remember when shorts were vilified? 2020? Yeah. Well, so I don't know anything about Adani Enterprises other than the guy became the second richest person in the world last year. Over a very short period of time. Well, that's right. If you look at a stock chart, and he has nine or 10 publicly traded entities in India. If you look at a stock chart, they all like quadrupled in the last three years. And now they've all been cut in half or worse. Um, so this Adani Enterprises, and it's like a conglomerate and they are like in energy and they're, they're like in everything. And they're very close with government officials. And the thing lost $100 billion plus in market cap in a couple of weeks. What's your take on what we're seeing there is that a bigger story for regulation in India and whether or not U.S. investors should trust any of the companies there? Or is this a very isolated, specific situation? So I would say um, these crazy stocks that go out of, come out of left field and all of a sudden propel a new billionaire or a new richest person in Asia, you know, that happens regularly and they don't last very long. If you when was the la What's another uh, example of that? I don't really remember. Uh, God, uh, you know, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, broker in Hong Kong that for a very brief period of time, and this was just last year, became worth more than Goldman Sachs, right? This is like a little <laughs> no-known broker that's trying to get onshore Chinese people to trade American stocks, right? It's maybe the equivalent of a Robin Hood okay. uh, in Hong Kong, right? Oh, Much I think smarter. I did read yeah. about that. And it was all of a sudden worth more than Goldman Sachs, but you know, Briefly. once that was pointed <laughs> out, it crashed right back down. So, you know, there are a lot of sort of meme stocks in Asia as well. And given sort of how illiquid those markets are, a few manipulators or a bit of a craze, a little bit of publicity could propel something to completely unreasonable territory. So I think this happens with more regularity than people imagine. Okay, why did no one in India point out all of the things that Hindenburg pointed out, which seem on the surface, look, they did a ton of work on this. And 
I don't have a view here. I'm not long. I'm not short. But one thing that you do have to say is enough people believe what Hindenburg wrote to produce this kind of reaction in the stock. And a lot of this stuff seems surface level with accounting things and things that any normal person that's a securities analyst should have picked up for themselves. Is there fear in a country like India to blow the whistle on something like this and it takes an overseas investor to say it out loud? Do you think that's some element of it? So we got to understand like other countries and their capital markets are more like the U.S. say in the 20s, 30s, right? They're they're generations behind. They don't have as much – right. They don't have as much time with a a stock market as we do. They're not as institutional, right? Most of the emerging market, equities market, China included, are 80 percent, 90 percent retail traded. Uh, And so the kind of quality that comes out of sell side is primarily to encourage more trading, more speculation, to drive trade volume rather than, you know, as as sort of research tool for the hedge funds, for the big pension funds. Uh, So the quality difference is very different and the motivation behind it is very different as well. So that's first of all. And uh, I think, you know, Hindenburg is also quite unique, right? They do really, really good deep research. Yeah. Uh, And so, yes, like you, I don't know very much about Donnie. But I I do know enough about the success of Hindenburg. Do you remember the wave of uh, overseas frauds um, from like 20 – that were unveiled from the great, great financial crisis like Sino Forest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Money and, Water was a big – Right. So, you know. so a lot of US-based hedge fund, like legendary hedge funds got caught up in Sino Forest and a few of the others. And I, I feel like that had an effect in that it dampened the interest – in emerging market investing, and it and it held back multiples for those stocks um, for like a generation. Oh yeah, true. So like, th- if this turns out to be as big of a fraud as is being alleged, and it really, cr- I mean, it's crashed already, but it really crashes. Like, what does that do to the mindset of people that are thinking about investing overseas in some of these less developed markets? So, I mean, first of all, I- I'm gonna gonna start, uh, you know, at market efficiency, right? Like. I'm a big proponent of index investing for U.S., right? When you're going to emerging markets, you're India, you're, you're China, uh, you got to be active. Otherwise, you have this crazy bubble that then, you know, takes a, a, a perhaps a fraudulent company to the number one cap in the index and it's going to drive it up and it's going to crash down. Uh, so when you go into those markets, you got to realize how inefficient they, they are, how big bubbles can get, uh, the risk of fraud. Uh, and if you go there, you got to have a manager who's local and actually know the culture. This is culture a big of part of the story that you tell when you meet investors all over the world is is like the, the fact that an index is not an index. Yeah. And in some of these places, you actually do have to do fundamental research. Yeah. You can't right. just hope that the, the market's fully efficient, everything priced correctly. You buy the index and you can participate in the growth because oftentimes those index suffers from – the biggest market cap company actually is the biggest dud. Do you think this is endemic of Indian stocks in general, or is there a buying opportunity being created away from Adani um, where there are stocks that are being unfairly associated with this thing that maybe got too cheap? And that, I think, is another opportunity with these markets, which is uh, a lot of bad companies get rewarded, and then when they are found out, it crashes the entire market and then creates opportunity for firms that are actually good. Yeah. What are the geopolitical implications of this? Like, an American company essentially destroying potentially an Indian company that employs tons of people and is a big, massive It's a good company. question because the guy, Adani, the, the billionaire, if he's still a billionaire, <laughs> most of his response was- American conspiracy? It, well, it was, it, he was wrapping himself in the Indian flag and it was like a nationalistic, like how dare these foreigners, you know, criticize our great companies here in India- which you could understand why that would be his defense. Um, so that's a really that's a good point. What do you think about that? I would say any time an entrepreneur go to that move, I get even more the suspicious. patriotic yeah. move. It's like yeah. no, defend your company, right? Yeah. This has nothing to do with India. There's nothing right. to do with Indian people. Defend what, your books. What's defend the quote? Your Patriotism is the last uh, refuge of the scoundrel, or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it, right. Uh, that's that sounds like something from our presidential policies in, re, in uh, recent years. I just saw. Um, getting back to earnings, I just saw a tweet from Gavin Baker that's pretty astonishing. This is from Goldman Sachs. He says, earnings per share misses are being bought so far this earnings season in a historic way with stocks outperforming 140 basis points after a miss. <laughs> this is an all-time best performance dating back to 2006. Stocks have literally never outperformed 
earnings misses like this. And I think this is – That's such- your sentiment rally. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's – I mean that's – this is the best illustration you could find yeah. of why it's a sentiment rally. Yes. Right? Like in, in real time. Yes. Like you say, sentiment rally could still last a long time, right? In the short run – it's rarely the fundamental, and look, market can stay irrational longer than you can stay on the sideline. Agree, agree with that. Let's talk about Apple. Uh, do you see the headset? Would you wear one of these? Do yeah. we have a picture of this? Yeah. All right. Throw that up. So I'm going to say something that's going to make me look stupid in five years. I will never put this on my face. <laughs> now, I know they will play this clip back and laugh at me when I'm walking Dude, down the street. With I agree it. with you. I said that about AirPods. No, but literally kiss my ass. <laughs> Can we do a show where you're Actually wearing Actually kiss my ass. All right. So here's the deal. Next time I come back, we're going to do the show with that headset. <laughs> so, come back in a very long time. <laughs> so for, from, from Bloomberg article, and we're going to hear about this headset in the, in, the, in the call today for sure. Within Apple, some of the top managers in charge of launching its new mixed reality headset believe the category could ultimately supplant the iPhone as the company's hallmark product. It's going to cost $3,000. So it's not gonna, there's not going to produce a million of these at first. Oh, my God. It's going to have more than a dozen cameras that can analyze the wearer's body, eye movements, and the external movement. They say people are going to wear it all day, every day. Yeah, okay. I'll take the, I'll take the underwear. <laughs> that. But here's the interesting thing. If you think about it, Apple, modern Apple, has never launched a piece of hardware that flopped, as far as I can recall. That is true. Amazon, a lot of the other companies have, have flunked against the wall. Apple has not done that. I think I think the watch at first was not a huge success, and then they made it better. So like they Probably. That, the other thing with Apple, Amazon and Apple are two very different mindsets. Yeah. Amazon will put out the Fire Phone. Right. It'll get laughed at on right. Twitter. And they say, okay, we're done. And no one buys it. And then they'll rip it out of the yeah. stores. Apple will fix it. And they've done that on numerous occasions. It I don't looks, know how it you, absurd. Yeah. I don't know how you fix this. I don't understand. I understand why they're trying to create it because definitely it's going to have a, a use, like, like a, a video game use, maybe watching movies. I think that's where I see it initially. But walking down the street, like, do you do you never want to have sex again? Is that like is that Apple's goal? Is is to sterilization of? The, so all Hold right. On. Apparently, this is what it's going to look like. Let me say. Oh, everyone's going to wear it. Come on, wear it. Where everyone's going to wear where, it. Wait, what do you do with the screen? Okay, so, so here's an idea. How about this? There's going to be a transparent mode where you can like you could wear it and be ta- be doing like a FaceTime yeah. and also be able to see through the guy so agree. you don't so you don't walk Michael, into somebody. I think, like the next generation, it's actually going to look like a fashion eyewear. Be like a pair of cool glasses, and then the next version after that, contact yeah. lenses. They're going to do 50 trillion in revenue from this thing. You really think so? I do. That's so bullish then. Uh, <laughs> if this is the next, I, I do. I really do. If you wear those, I'm going to punch yeah, you. It, no, no, no. <laughs> At, version one is going to be ludicrously hilarious. I'm just telling you, you better be a late adopter on this. Oh, I'm late. I'm, I'm, I'm not buying this. You're not buying version no uh, 1.0? No, no, no way. But Jason's right. It'll be it'll be a, a, a contact and then a chip in our brain and Apple, yeah. I will wait until it's a chip in the brain. <laughs> Yeah, and and the, that that chip is connected to Chat GPT, so we will be able to regurgitate the smartest people uh, instantly, and uh, and and that'll be the end of uh, higher education. So, f- it, the uh, f- Meta is working so hard at owning this market, and the reason why is because look at what their reliance on the iPhone has done to their profitability. The iOS privacy changes have like literally. Uh, thrown their okay. their product into upheaval, and I'm sure they'll fix it. But, but they realize if they don't own the hardware, it's going to be very hard for them to control their own destiny. So they really want the Oculus and all their VR products to take off. If Apple's going to launch this in two months, Oof. they're going to have an event this spring. Most people are not going to buy it for $3,000, but just the fact that they are going to be in the game, I think makes a lot of the investing that Facebook has done over the last few years kind of like null and void. Because you know Apple will be better at this than than Meta is. I know. That's why I'm a little concerned about the yeah, 20% yeah. pop yeah. with Facebook yeah. yesterday. Um, so Amazon Web Services, the, the growth is like historical, right? Um, but Jim Chanos just tweeted this. The net sales went from 39%. This is just net sales growth. Forget about uh, currencies. 39, 40, 37, 33, 28, 20. I mean, there's a lot of competition. There. Well, what is this? Amazon? AWS. AWS. Yeah. Just, AWS? Just AWS? Okay, but how much bigger is it now well, than I, well, it was when said, it was yeah, doing I'm saying, I'm, well, but, but not as not as big. So when it was doing 39, it was 16. Now it's 21. So it's not that much. So growth is, slow, is slowing it's, dramatically. 
You know how many like venture capital Com- backed companies? Yeah, exactly. But you know how many like venture back. Uh, capital backed companies, all of them raised money and just turned that money directly into to a, to AWS, AWS yeah, or, <laughs> or Azure. Them. All of them, like that. So that 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 part is gone. Uh, we're gonna end with one last thing. Did you you know about the Fire Festival? Did you ever see that uh, documentary with on the Netflix? Y, with the Y. Mm. Okay, so this guy this guy threw an event that was a complete fraud. It was supposed to be a festival concert uh. on an island in the Caribbean, and it became like one of the world's greatest, uh, I guess, I guess like he was promising something that he couldn't deliver. Yeah, I was about to say, I don't know if it's an outright scam or just a giant fail. <laughs> it's like a little bit of both. Yeah. Because sometimes so, it was just a ton, Exactly. <laughs> there's just a ton of over He got like thousands of like young people in their teens and 20s to like fly to this island and he put them in tents and he was serving them like MREs. Like <laughs> What's an MRE? Meals ready to eat. Like, oh, okay. like they ran out of food the yeah. first day. Here's a cheese stick. Uh, he ended up going to jail, so they definitely okay, so didn't think it was, it was just was a- Was it Ja Rule that was involved? Yeah, yeah. Ja Rule and- That's a good point. He did go to jail, so I'm guessing there was probably some fraud right. involved. Anyway, it was one of the best documentaries ever on Netflix. And they Hulu. documented, like, how is this possible? They had all these bands they said were going to play. <laughs> and none and of them showed up. They all backed out because their advanced team got to the island, and they're like, yeah. no, 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 you can't come here. And these people, it ended up like Lord of the Flies almost before all these people were rescued off this island. It's amazing. This just happened. All right. Billy McFarland, the fraudster and entrepreneur who co-founded the disaster. Yeah, you see the military tents and you know this did not go as intended. Uh, the Fire Festival in 2017 is now a free man after four years of prison and six months of house arrest ended September. He claims he used his time behind bars cooking up his next business project, le- leveraging his marketing resume for startup clients. And this time he's promising it isn't a scam. McFarlane admitted that while he broke the law, his marketing credentials are indisputable after executing one of the most viral social media campaigns ever. You imagine. Here's what I thought. As Can't as I argue with this. that. <laughs> he missed his window. 2021 I know. would have been the ultimate environment for Billy McFarlane. Mm-hmm. He could have had a crypto yeah, event. I know. Yeah, absolutely. He could be working for FTX. He could be selling NFTs. He could be doing all of those things at the same time, basically. He kind of he missed his window. He sh- he almost should stay in jail <laughs> until the next bubble comes along, and then emerge and tell us about his marketing credentials. Um, anyway, I thought I thought that was interesting. Could be, you know, cellmates with uh, you know Sam uh, Bankman Fried. <laughs> well, listen, this guy Jordan Belfort is out there selling marketing courses and like how to. I, I guess, it, dude, it's, it's inconceivable that anybody would give these people money, but they do. Like, is it a joke? Are they doing it like as a goof? Like to like. You don't think Shkreli's going to make $5 million in the next 10 years? D- doing what? Martin Shkreli. Doing whatever the f*** he wants. He w- there are certain people, there are certain people where nothing st- like st- sticks to them. I don't know if that's, that's, that makes me depressed or excited for our country. Maybe a little bit of both. Well, here's what should make you not depressed at least. We have a very rich history of that going back to the 1600s. Oh, yeah. And a lot of what, what made this country in the early days was people making promises they couldn't deliver. No, Jefferson was a total scam artist. <laughs> no, no, no. I always said that. How do you think they got people to go to Jamestown? Right, right. How do you think they yeah. got people to leave Europe and come here? They just made it's shit up. A giant party. Yeah. Well, I mean, literally. <laughs> all right, it's all good. This is a you very- You see their goats. This is a very sick. American. This is a very American thing. Okay, we're going to do what, Jason, did you have fun today? Yeah. We had a great time. Always we're so, we're so, we're so glad you came. Um, All right, so we're 0 for 2 with the Tech Giants. We've got Apple after after we wrap. I'm excited. All right, so you you have a lot of travel coming up. Yeah, going to Europe. Uh, but before that, going to the Middle East. Okay, so you're going to a whole bunch of countries in the Middle East. Yeah, five countries, one each day. Okay, wow. and you're going to bring your virtual reality headset on this trip? Maybe not this one. <laughs> Next one. Next one when it's cool fashion eyewear. That's a good That's a good use case I could think of it on, on a 10-hour flight. Oh, hell Yeah. I'd rather be in virtual reality than be in actual reality in that situation. So at least Apple can sell it to all the major airlines. Can they fix internet on on airplanes? No. It's Why is it so hard? How about in airports? (laughs) My favorite, they say, oh, free public Wi-Fi. I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't work. They're like, yeah, but it's free. free. It's free. (laughs) So um, we're going to do favorites now. Any books, any any anything you've been reading or or listening to lately? What should what should our viewers and uh, listeners know about? Okay, so I got hooked on Wordle. Mm. 
So I think that that that's going around, right? And that's how did good, you get right? hooked on Wordle Jason's via social adopter. media? Late adopter. Okay. I know, late adopter. My wife told me about it, and I started only a few days it ago. Is fun. And I am completely addicted. What do you like about it? It's like you. It's like uh, relaxing, right? Well, and part is I haven't had to really spell anything correctly for a very long time because autocorrect, right? You <laughs> and you know, te- you know, voice dic- dictation. And now I'm trying to get the part of my brain back that used to know what the right spelling looks like. And uh, and so it's, it's it's a part of my brain that has been activated for a while. Sorry, Ooh. Apple missed on both. Ay. All right, let's not go out on a low note. Right, we'll, get, we'll get to that next week. Uh, I got two, and then Michael, you'll you'll uh, you'll finish us up. Go ahead. I just listened to Bill Burr, one of my favorite comics, on with uh, David Spade and Dana Carvey, and uh, it's it's just an awesome conversation. So if you're a fan of uh, Bill Burr's or the other guys, it's uh, it's fly on fly on the fly on a wall is the name of, is the name of the show. And the other one is, are you watching Your Honor? Do you know mm-hmm. that show? I'm back. I, back? Only, I only saw the first episode, but I'm all the way back. Of season two? I'm all the way, I, so I thought I was out, but the first episode, I mean, I'm back. You got, John, you watch this? No. Oh, yeah. he, looks like, he, looks like, he looks like Walter White again. <laughs> he does. He looks crazy. Yeah, he looks crazy. Uh, anyway, uh, season two got underway. I think it's, I think it's pretty good. Uh, Mike, what do you got for us? Um, season three. Uh, not season three. I'm sorry. Episode three of uh, The Last of Us. So Nick oh, Offerman and Mari Bartlett. About that. Nick Offerman. That's what you should watch on your flight on an HBO Max app. Oh, you should I watch The Last of Us. 17-hour flight. So, so Mari Bartlett yeah, yeah. is known to the audience as Armand from season one of White Lotus. And him and this other guy. It's kind of incredible how epic that sh- that episode was. Nick what Offerman we, was from Parks and Rec. Yeah, what they were able to do, like they built the whole world between these these two dudes like in just uh, 45 minutes. Like it was pretty epic. There's nothing like HBO. There's just nothing like it. The, the quality of their content is unparalleled. They basically, they, they show like these two guys meet each other. It's the end of the world and one guy's a survivalist. A prepper. So he takes this whole town in New England and turns it into a fortress and he's all by himself, but he can do everything. Like he knows how he breaks into the utility and keeps the natural gas running. He knows how to like, uh, he has all the weapons. He's growing his own food. He builds his own fences. He's like, he's just like one of those dudes. Man, I got a buddy like that and he's totally preparing for okay. the end of the oh, world. He'll be so good. He'll be good. I am going to so stay he tight should, to him. So he should watch this episode of the last of us, the third episode. So then like, uh, right, no I don't want to ruin it for anyone, episode. but like he, uh, he meets somebody who needs to be saved, but then they show you like, 20 years of their lives it's, together. And, and 40, and like, how long are they on screen for? 35 minutes? Yeah, maybe. How do they do maybe that? 40 minutes. How do they, they show you an, an entire life. Life. Yeah. And uh, by the end of it, the episode ends and we won't talk about that. But you just like, holy shit, was that a movie? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or what? Did I just watch it's a whole TV. season of it's, a show? It's HBO. It so was really listen, amazing. listen, we spoke, we opened the show with which one of these companies can miss and reverse all the good news. Well, <laughs> well, well, they all missed, but the good news is the queues are only down one and a half percent of the after hours. Um, oh, so it must have been really bad. That's not that, dude, that's nothing. It was up 3.6 percent today. Yeah. Right. So, so we'll see, we'll see what tomorrow brings. Jason, sentiment. This, so we're going out of sour note, but did he have fun? I had fun. Absolutely. We confirmed that he had fun. A lot of he fun. He can't leave until he tells us he had fun. <laughs> Jason, we, we love having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming. And, Thank you for uh, having me. want to wish you safe travels. Uh, Duncan, any announcements we need to make here? Uh, we're all good. We're all set? Oh, we have uh, one. We have one. We have one quick one. Next week, we're not doing What Are Your Thoughts on Tuesday. We're moving it to Wednesday. Oh, yeah. So don't look for us Tuesday night because uh, you're, where are you going to be? In, Miami. Uh, you're going to the exchange going conference? Going to ETF exchange. So if you'll be there, come say hi. All right, very cool. So we will see you guys on Wednesday night instead of Tuesday. Our thanks to Jason Shu. Jason, where's the best place for people to follow you and your work? Follow me on LinkedIn. Just Google Jason Shu and go to my LinkedIn page. Okay, so everyone's going to follow Jason there. And I follow you there. I read all your stuff. I think you do a really great job. And uh, you are, uh, is Radiant, Radiant.com? Yeah. What's the best place to... What's the best place to learn more about your funds? Uh, Funds.Raylian.com. Funds.Raylian.com. All right. Our thanks to Jason, John, Duncan, Nicole. Great job this week. Guys, thanks for listening, and we will see you next time.